Let me get this set up real quick. All right. So for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Andy Patrick. I'm uh, one of the home church pastors here, and I'm here to tell you my story. So uh, I grew up in beautiful Foster City, California. Uh, for those of you who know Foster City, California, uh, uh, it is, uh, some people know it as the Wisteria Lane of the Bay. Uh, it's a very like ideal neighborhood. You know, everyone is is like middle class suburban, and I cr I grew up pretty much like that. I had uh, just about everything you could need. My family wasn't like, you know, off the walls rich, but we never wanted for anything. You know, we always had food on the table. I had friends and family that loved me. I had good schools. I had a church that was down the street. You know, all all the boxes were checked in my life growing up. Um, so I was also the, uh, the youngest of four kids. I have two older sisters and an older brother. And uh, as I grew up, I constantly uh, would see my older siblings and the other kids around me. Uh, they would all, as they grew up, they'd try to find their, their passion. I feel like that's a big thing for American kids growing up, that they're always kind of told, you need to find your passion. Whatever that one thing is that will fuel you, fuel you for the rest of your life, you can make it your work, you can make it your hobby, and if you find that one thing in your life that, can, uh, that you can kind of anchor into, then all the rest of your life will be set. So a lot of my early childhood and, and you know, teenage years were trying to find that. And um, so... Uh, I'm going to give a little, uh, little visual aid here with the use of some of my daughter's toys uh, to explain this. Um, so, you know, at, at growing up, you'd see a lot of people that, and, and, and they would be trying out different things, like, you know, different hobbies or schools or relationships, uh, you know, in order to find that passion. And so the way that I would always picture all of my, uh, you know, all the other students and all the other kids in my school, they would be trying these things out to see what stuck. So you'd have one kid, and he would try football or something. He would try it out. What do you know? It's stuck. He, that, that would be, the, you know, that person's passion. Oh, I found football. Another person, they would get into a relationship with a boy or a girl and see what they stuck. Wow, makes them so happy. Seems so great. Another kid would, uh, you know, go to school. They'd get into Stanford or whatever. Like, you know, let's see what that stuck. Oh, great. You know, 16 years old. I already have my, my plan for life kind of set up. That's what it looked like when I kept, like, looking around at all my other, uh, all the other kids, okay? On the other hand, this is me. So I'd be doing the same thing. I would be doing hobbies, you know, even the ones I would get at and be like, yeah, let's try football. <laughs> okay, let's, let's, let's ask a girl out. <laughs> All right, let's try, uh, I don't know, anything. <laughs> All right, that didn't work. Um, and so for me, that's what uh, what it was, as a, you know, life as a teenager, I'd be trying new things out, trying to find my passion. What's that one thing that can stick with me and fuel me for the rest of my life? And there wasn't. Nothing was sticking. Again, I would be good at things, and I'd be happy, but nothing, like, really drove me forward. And what happened in my life was that without that passion, there wasn't really a motivation to, to try to push past the bumps in my life, you know? So if, you know, school or something got hard, there would never be that motivation to kind of grind through because there was no passion in my life to really, you know, see myself in a future going forward with that. And so this pattern of failure started to develop in my life, especially in school, you know, that like I'd be doing, you know, decent in classes and then I'd kind of fall down and, uh, you know, grades would drop, I'd be grounded, I couldn't, I couldn't do things. But then right before summer, I'd bring my grades back up, you know, just enough for my parents to kind of go back to turning a blind eye, Okay. Then my third year of high school, junior year, it kind of all fell apart, okay? So the, about two-thirds of the way through the year, the report cards came out, and I was failing half my classes. I was not doing well in the rest. And as a result of that, not only was I not doing well in school, obviously my parents grounded me from basically anything that was relevant in my life, and I couldn't do sports anymore, because when you have a 1.1 GPA, you can't do sports. So again, you can kind of envision this, that this is me trying to do things. There's three pillars that were kind of holding up my life, I would say, at the time. There's God, school, and sports, okay? The problem, as you may imagine, is that they were all kind of held up in equal regard, okay? All, of the, all three of these things were uh, of equal value in my life. But then when I lost, when I lost uh, the ability to do school and sports, two of those things, uh, they, they crashed down at the same time. And that was me. I had nothing left. I kept trying to stick things. 
Nothing was sticking. And so I began questioning myself. Why did this happen to me? It didn't feel like it was happening to anyone else. What was wrong with me? Was I bad at the things I did? Was I stupid? Was I unpopular? Was I uh, ugly? Was I unhappy? Was I depressed? And I was searching rampantly for answers because, again, there was nothing left, it felt like. And then the continual problem was with when, you, when there's nothing there and you're searching for answers, nothing's sticking. Even when I went to the radical stuff, you know, of like, you know, do I need to, you know, move? Do I need to run away from home? Do I need to, you know, just, you know, even end it? Like, nothing made sense. Nothing stuck. Even finding negative passions wasn't working. I wasn't finding any answers in my life. And so that led to the final realization, at least in my mind as a 17-year-old, that I was completely worthless. If everyone else could find something that motivated themselves in life, and I couldn't, I must be worthless. And so that's basically what happened in my life at that point. I pretty much spent every morning or every evening of my, uh, of my life just going to my bedroom and lie down, stare at the ceiling, wait for anything to happen, because I didn't have any motivation to do anything. And it was in that moment, even though I knew God, I wasn't really praying to him. At that moment, I started praying to God in desperation. And I'd pray, God, I don't know what's going on. And I don't know how I got here. And I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. All I know is that I need you to fix this. And he did. <laughs> he fixed it in very short order. I went to school the next day after I prayed that prayer, and I got called into a meeting with my parents and the principal, and they say, all right, we know what's going on. Here's the plan to get you finished with high school. We're going to move you out of this class. You're going to retake this in summer. And suddenly there was a plan for everything in my life. I went to the therapist I'd been seeing, and the therapist said, hey, I'm going to refer you to the psychologist in our, in our office, or a psychiatrist, so we can get you a little bit more help. And everyone in my life, it felt like, started to come around to... Uh, to understanding more, that they, they stopped trying to, you know, fix the symptoms of what was in my life, and, and they tried to, you know, fix the root, you know, help with the root cause of depression. And over the next couple of years, I regained a sense of, of myself through Christ, because I knew that all those people that helped me, like, yes, I know, and I'm very thankful and grateful, but it was pretty impossible to deny that God had sent them all, and every, his footprints were over everything, you know, in, in my life. But as much as, as that is today, let me tell you something. Um, inside, if you were to strip God away, I'm still the same kid, all right? I still don't really have passions aside from God, and there's still a part of me that kind of clings to that, that depression and that desperation. But it's God that's given me everything in my life. He gives me, when I, when I seek after him, he gives me love, and he gives me dedication. He gives me curiosity, hard work, empathy, all of these things. He has given me a life through him. He gives me a purpose. And so my story at, at its heart is for those of you out there who maybe feel like you don't have anything to offer. If you feel like nothing's sticking in your life and you don't have any, you know, talents or motivations or passions or whatever, like, that's fine. God is ready to work with you. And he has a plan for you that is better than anything you could ever see. And that's my story. Okay. So... I'm here to talk about passion today, okay? So, and I'm not talking about like the, the, the passions that I talked about earlier where you're, you know, you're trying to find a hobby, you're trying to find a, something that, that the world can provide that we can cling after. I'm talking about the, the passion of, of Christ that would come after people like me that clearly provide no value and wants to save them and redeem them and protect them. So uh, I'm going to do the traditional pastor and dad thing, and I'm going to start off with a sports analogy because that's where I get in my zone. So, uh, how many people here know what a draft is in sports? Okay, good. Like, half of you. And some, not all men. <laughs> so, for those of you that don't, the draft is a time every year in all the major sports when all the uh, young athletes who have come of age, around 18, uh, they get put into a, a, a big pool, not a literal pool, uh, and the major sports organizations take turns picking them one by one. They, you know, they want, they want this person to be on their team, the next person gets a pick, and then blah, 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 blah until all the good players are gone. Okay. So, and they, they make a big deal of it. They, you know, there's always like a, a show you can watch, and there's, you know, there, there's commercial breaks, and they have people there that are experts that are breaking down all the picks and if they like it or don't. So I'd like to, to imagine that uh, the major religions of the world, for a moment, are going to have a draft, okay? And they're picking all their, all, all their favorite people, okay? So it's God's turn. Jesus walks up to the podium like this. He gets up there, and every, you know, a hush falls over the audience. 
He says, with the next pick in the major religions of the world draft, the triune god, select Andy Patrick, a depressed 17-year-old from Foster City, California. <laughs> so, yeah, that's usually what happens. <laughs> uh, but, and you can plug in anything. You can plug in, you know, uh, uh, Alice, the, uh, the single mom uh, that's unemployed, or, you know, Bob, the uh, recovering alcoholic stuck in jail. But all of these people... Uh, that, you know, basically that are off the draft radar, okay? So yeah, normally there'd be this wave of cheers, but in this case, no one knows who Andy is. So it's like confused murmurs instead, and then the, the camera goes over to the, the guys in the talking heads, and they're ruffling through their papers. They have no idea what just happened. So eventually they start talking because they're on TV, and they say, well, I kind of hate the pick. <laughs> like, Andy Patrick, the depressed teenager, 17-year-old, he has nothing to offer a team. He cannot speak very well. He has no girlfriend. He will probably never get married. He, <laughs> he's not very good at sports. He doesn't play the guitar. <laughs> there is nothing he can offer a church. Why would Jesus pick him? No one understands this pick. And yet, the camera pans back over to Jesus, and he's back over with God and the Holy Spirit, and they are jumping for joy. Like, they just got the steal of the draft. <laughs> like, no one knows about this kid, and yet they are going nuts. And you're sitting at home watching. You just got picked by God. And you don't even know what's going on. Like, why would he pick me? Like, what is going on? And it's clear, it's clear from all this that God has been watching you for a long time. And he sees something in you that the world doesn't see. He sees something in you that you don't see. And it seems that whatever plan they ha that, that, that God has for you is better than the plan that you have. Okay? So, I'm here to talk to you about that God. Just a sec. I should have opened this before him. So I'm here to talk to you about the God that loves you and has a love that looks past your worthlessness and, your, uh, and, and all the things that are going wrong with you, okay? And I'm here to talk to you about God's passion and not, again, not our transient, you know, whims that can go to and fro and, and, and we lose focus. I'm here to talk about the, the singular focus of Jesus who wants to save you and redeem you. And I'm here to convince you to try to follow his passion, even when you don't know what that word means. Even if you're at a point like, like I was, where the board comes crashing down, you have lost all semblance of what the word passion even means, and you're just trying to make it through the day. Okay? So what we're gonna be, where we're going to be focusing here is in the book of 1 Peter. Okay? So Peter, if I can get my thing to work, uh, Peter, well, he was a man of passion. Okay? So You'll hear a couple of stories from, from Peter's past. Peter, uh, at one point, was asked by Jesus, who do people claim that I am? And Peter said, who, me? Oh, I claim you, you're the Messiah. I don't, you know, some people say that you're Elijah, and some people say these other things, but I say that you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, I, I give you the king, keys to the kingdom of heaven. But that passion, that also didn't, that also served Peter wrong sometimes. Peter got to the point, at one point, when he said, you know, Jesus, I will never deny you. And Jesus said, yes, you will. You remember Peter denied Jesus three times before the sun came up on the day that he was crucified. Peter was a man of passion, and it did him good and bad, okay? But we're going to be looking at it, uh, in the book that Peter wrote, First Peter. Uh, uh, I'm going to be bouncing around the whole book, okay? We're going to start in First Peter 1, 13 through 16, okay? says, I'm going, to look, I'm going to read this one. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So that word passion, okay? Uh, the word in the Greek is uh, epithumia is what the app that I use says. It says epithumia. And what that word means, it means uh, kind of like the base desires of humanity. It means desire or like lust or craving, okay? Um, for instance, Jesus uses the word when Jesus is giving the, the, the parable of the, the seed sown among, um, amongst different environments. When he talks about the seed being sown among thorns and that gets choked out by the desire of the world. And when he says desire of the world, that's epithumia, okay? And then Paul uses the word again in the book of Romans when he's talking about uh, the people that are given up to the passion of their flesh. When he talks about passion of their flesh, that's epithumia, okay? So this is the word that we're talking about here. So uh, it's a bad thing, as you can see, uh, at least according to the Bible. And for me, like, that, that's what the word passion means when I talked in my story about trying to find my passion. 
I'm trying to find things that were in the world that are going to sustain me all of my days and push me forward, okay? And again, I think that I'm not particularly unique in this regard. I think most American teenagers are trying to find their passion, that thing that they can make into a career and they can, you know, you know they can, they'll stay up late doing or whatever. I wanted that one thing in my life that would make me my best self. I just thought if I can find this one thing on the world, you know, whether it's, it's your know, school or whatever, it's going to turn, it's going to unlock me and make me the, the best person I can be. Um, but that, that search, that search for trying to find something in the world to, to sustain us, that's not really what, it doesn't really jive with this passage, does it? So, if you, like, if you look at it, it says that, that we are to be obedient children in verse 14, uh, not conformed to the passions of our former ignorance. He wants us, God doesn't say, yeah, you know, yeah, like, oh, yeah, now that you've come to me, go find something on earth and, and pursue it with all your heart. No, no, no. It says we're to be, uh, we're obedient children, not conformed to the passion. Because that's what happens when we serve our passions, right? It, it twists us and it turns us in, in, into something, into pursuing something on this world that is, not, that is not God instead. He wants us to be holy, like obedient children. So keep that in mind. We're going to go a couple, a couple verses ahead to verses 17 through 19. It says, And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So, again, when I started to seek passion in my life, it, it, didn't, it, it didn't bring about the happiness that I wanted because nothing was sticking. It brought it, it, I wanted to find myself, and all I was finding was sadness. Every thing that I pursued, it left me feeling more and more like, like nothing was going to stick for me. And seeking passion on this earth, it's a very common thing in this world, but it's not entirely a, a biblical thing, right? So it says here in verse, uh, it, it was, uh, it says here in verse 17, that we are to conduct ourselves with fear throughout the time of our exile. You know, exile meaning we've been kicked out from our home, that we have to live abroad for some indeterminate amount of time. This is what Peter is, is calling our time on earth, that we, right now, this very day, we are in exile. We are not home. Nothing when you're in exile should, you know, be like, oh, yeah, this is why I've been sent to exile, is to find this one thing. No, you're not supposed to enjoy your time in exile. It's not to say we're supposed to be totally unhappy, but we're supposed to be trying to pursue our true home, which is in heaven. When, God, when Jesus came down, he freed us from this struggle of trying to find passions and trying to, you know, trying to find that thing on earth that will sustain us. We don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to find the one thing that's going to keep us happy he, because he is that one thing that's happy. He came down and he sacrificed so that we don't have to keep pursuing things. And if you think that, that you need, like, if you need that one thing on earth in order to propel you into serving God, if you need to, you know, again, have some gift, if you need to be able to, to sing well or preach well or host people in your home or have money or whatever in order to serve God, that's wrong. That's backwards. Serving God is the goal. And then the salvation of the earth and showing everybody the love that we found, that is the goal. And if you serve God, he will give you a passion like he's given me a passion. If you continue to, ser to try to find something on the world that will propel you into further service with God, you've got it all backwards, okay? Sometimes it feels like, like that we are stuck chasing this carrot on the, on the stick, right? And we're in the middle of, of a field of carrots, right? God has given us, he's ready to give us whatever we need. But sometimes we can feel like we're, like we're in church, like that we are uh, trying to, to, to pursue after an earthly gift instead of pursuing the kingdom of God and using those earthly gifts, okay? So, we're, let's say, the, so right now we're these people, right, we're, that, are, that are pursuing after him, okay? Uh, we're going to skip over to our next passage. That's 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. Right up there. I'm just going to read it. <laughs> okay, so it says, uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12, that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, there's that word again, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. You ever wish like you had more to offer to the kingdom? I've been to certain churches where all the people on staff are amazing people by any, by any standard. You know, you have, people, you have speakers that will come on stage, and when they come to town, they will sell out arenas. And you have worship pastors that, that when they put it on an album, it tops the, you know, the, the, the billboard charts, charts, sometimes even outside of the Christian music charts. It tops the secular music charts. And you have, uh, you have, you have people that will, pastors that will like, write books, and you know, everybody will, uh, will, will read them, and it will pursue them on to, to all these amazing things. But the reality is that most of us, I mean, maybe you guys are, most of us aren't like that in our lives. For the most part, we just kind of feel like, excuse me, normal blokes that are like, I feel like we don't have these amazing things to offer, and maybe we even feel like we've wasted a lot of our life. Instead of trying to feel like, like, like we've done everything we can for God, maybe some of us feel like uh, that we haven't done all those amazing things. Like, you remember the, the, the draft that I talked about, the, you know, with the, fir- with the first pick or whatever? Like, we're not a very good pick for the draft. If you look on the, all the boxes that make a good worship person or a, a good servant of God, a lot of the things that the world would look at to try to find a good servant of God, we may not, don't necessarily have that. But kind of that's the point, right? Jesus doesn't pick us because he's like, you know what I need? I really need a good worship pastor. We're kind of, you know, the plan's kind of falling apart if we don't get a good speaker or whatever like that. No, no, no. Jesus drafts us, and then he gives us a plan to live for him. He gives us the, the, the words to say and all that. So he, he, his plan looks past all of our, inefic- or, 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 all our inefficiencies or deficiencies or whatever. And if you feel passionless and you feel like you don't have anything to offer to the world in this regard— that's an okay thing, because that la- when you don't have, a, you know, a passion that's pr- spurring you on, that lets you live life with the fear that, that Peter is mentioning in here, and, you're, and it's letting God shine. That lets you devote all of your time and energy to love, or to, to service, or to hospitality, or to whatever God ha- ha- has for you. When I want, when I, when people look at me, and when they think about you know, what is, the, what is Jesus doing to this man? I don't want them to see me. Because as we've established, there's nothing really special about me when just left to my own devices. If left to my own devices, I'm pro- probably just going to play video games and eat pizza and fall asleep. So I want them people to see me. When they look at me, I want them to see Jesus. I want them to see all the great things that Jesus has done in my life. And instead of seeing, you know, the, the, the depressed kid that doesn't have anything going on, I want them to see, wow, Look at the amazing things that Jesus has done in this man's life, okay? So we're moving on a little bit. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 11, okay? Since there, this would be a little bit of a long passage. Maybe I'll drink water. All right. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 11 says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of that time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless, idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that those judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. For whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we're a royal priesthood, this says. A royal priesthood. That's a lot better than being, you know, depressed kids. Royal priesthood. 
So, you know, passion in the world, like that's for everyone that, 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 that doesn't have something in life. We, on the other hand, we have a, a, a way that we're supposed to live because we're royal priests, this passage says. Priesthood means living apart. You know, like, you remember the, the, the idea that there was these, you know, monasteries, you know, where monks would go and they would live apart from the world because they need to wholly de- devote themselves wholly to God. I'm not telling you to do that, but there should be something different about the way that we live. It should look a little different, right? It says in, the, in, that, it says in that passage, it said that uh, in, in verse 4, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they will malign you. So you know what that word malign means? Another time that, 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 this, that this word is used in the Bible is uh, when Jesus talks about the idea of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. That's the same word. That word blaspheming is, is that translated in here as the word malign. If That's a really, you know, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is obviously a horrible thing. Um, if you need to know more about that, you should go talk to, like, Jeff or Tim or Laura. You should talk to a real pastor, because... <laughs> so I'm not getting into that right now. <laughs> okay, but um, as you can see, it's a, it's a really bad thing, okay? And this is what it says the world is going to be doing to us. It says that we're going to be maligned for our, for our following God. It says that, that, that when we live for God, it's going to be, like, it's going to be propelling us to such behavior uh, Again, that without passion, letting us devoting all of our energy to love, to hospitality, to 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 serving the uh, to to serving our fellow man, that we should look different, and the world's going to hate us because they don't they don't want to be reminded of what of what could be in their life. They want to pursue after their passions with everything that they have, right? And again, this isn't a matter of like I'm not saying that that when you come to Christ that you have to completely discard all of the gifts in your life. Like if you have gifts you have a, a gift for music or for speaking, like, it's, it's good to use those things for God. You just need to make sure that when you use them, you're using them in, in temperance, okay? Not impulsiveness. Again, we don't, we don't go to church as a, way to, uh, as a way to become better musicians. You know, like, oh, well, I need a band to play with, so I'm going to go to church. Or, you know, I need, a, I need a wife or I need a husband, so I'm going to go to church. Or, you know, I need to meet people, so I'm going to go to church. This is, this is backwards, you are using God in that sense in order to further yourself. In this regard, we should be serving God and letting him do whatever he wants with our lives. If he wants us to have friends or, or a relationship or, you know, be in a band or whatever, like, as, you can still use those things. Just make sure that, that you're using them in a way that, that, that God is glorified instead of us being glorified. So this whole process, I can imagine, um, it sounds a little intimidating at times. But I have a little bit of a word of encouragement, okay? I have uh, 1 Peter 4, 6 through 11, okay? 1 Peter 4, 6 through, or 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11, I'm sorry. Uh, it says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So as I kind of mentioned, you know, uh, my wife Laura and I, we started a home church uh, nearly two years ago, goodness. Um, and when we started our home church, there wasn't a blueprint, you know, like we weren't the, the, the thousandth person from Cedars to start a home church, and we have all these people that can tell us, you know, oh, here's what you can and can't do. We just kind of, you know, I mean, we had training, but we did it, and we, we put ourselves out there. And it was really, really hard. Um, Every week, because we're reaching into our inner circle and we're trying to bring people into church, it's not the sort of thing where people just instantly lined up in our living room to learn about God. It was tough. Every week we would prepare and we'd, we'd, we'd think of a, you know, we'd come up with, with, with a message to say and we'd prep things for the kids and we didn't know if anyone was going to show up. Sometimes nobody showed up. Sometimes different people showed up. Sometimes more people showed up. But this, it, this, this the feeling of following God and, and serving a home church it was tough. There were multiple weeks where, you know, we felt like we weren't accomplishing anything, and we felt like people weren't really being hit. And at least for me, 
that, re- that feeling of rejection sometimes, it can be pretty crippling. As I've kind of mentioned, I, I've, I have a lot of experience with, with things not working out, uh, but that doesn't make it any easier. Um, that depression, that feeling that, I, that I'm doing something wrong for, this, for the kingdom of God, that I'm not using my gifts right, it's always going to be there for me, right? And it's always going to be painful. It's always going to feel like maybe I should have done something different. And that's just the way, that's just the way I am. And I'm not saying that I have it, you know, the worst of all. You know, there's probably a lot of you out there that have it worse than I do, you know? Maybe some of you have, you know, are, are, are suffering through broken relationships that, that and, or your, um, you know, your, your employment is, is going down and you feel like, like you don't have any anchor to cling to and things are, 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 are falling apart all around you. Um, that's really hard, and I'm sorry. I really wish that, that you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be praying for all of you. Um, but when you feel like that, and when you feel like, like everything's crumbling around you, like that's when God is, is the most ready to help you. And he needs to, you know, in this passage, just asking you to let go of some of that. In fact, I was, I was so struck by, the, by this, in that in, in verse 7, it says, he wants you to cast all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And we're not talking, you know, like they don't, they don't use the word like sin and then let sin, you know, like, carry over all these things. He says specifically to cast your anxieties on him. And I don't think, I think it's pretty common sometimes that, that, that we've all got anxieties that we're dealing with and we don't know what to do with. Jesus, it says, Paul says that, that, that we should cast our anxieties on him because he cares for us. I think about that. Like the God of the universe, he sent his son to die for us individually because he cares for us, not just because he's trying to check, his bo- check boxes. He's not just trying to, to, to to get his numbers up or something. He individually cares for every one of you. He, when Jesus died, when he sacrificed his life, he, he was ready to take on everything that you could possibly give him. He wants all of your sin, and all your anxiety. He wants it on him. And furthermore, it says in here that, like, you know, our time on earth isn't easy. We've got it says the, in verse 8, it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful, for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Like, we need to take that seriously. <laughs> that, like, when we feel these feelings of, of, of depression and anxiety, that, and we feel like, like, like things are crumbling around us, like, that's not just a coincidence. You know, like, that's, the, you know, the devil's there like a roaring lion, it says. Jesus doesn't want us to fight those battles alone. He wants us to be, you know, to be by his side, be back to back with fellow believers. He wants us under his shield. He wants us to protect us from that roaring lion that's there. And again, I don't know, like, what everybody is is suffering. I imagine probably everybody, like, I truly believe that, that, that people's depressions and people's feelings are unique and I can't walk up to you and say, I know exactly what you're feeling. And I, you know, that, that, that because I've gone through that, I, I, I believe that everyone's feelings are unique. But even though I don't know what everyone is feeling, Jesus does. Like, it says that when he went into the garden to be tempted by Satan, that he resisted all temptation. He has resisted every feeling that could possibly pull someone away from God. And he resisted it. He knows what you're going through. He you know, you don't have to show up to God and explain to him, like, oh, let me tell you all these things. He's, no, 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 he's ready. His sacrifice is perfect because he knows all sin. He has resisted it. He has beaten it. He has risen from the grave. And if you've got no passion at all, and if you feel like, like everything around you is crumbling and you're not entirely sure what's going on here, I would, I, you know, I just got to tell you, reach out to him, folks, because he's ready. Just like I was, you know, on the, on the floor of the room there, when I reached out to him and I said, I don't know what's going on, and I don't know how I got here, and I don't know where I'm going, and I needed him, whew, he was ready. Let me tell you that just because you feel like everything around you is crumbling, and you've got nothing, and nothing is sticking, you are not beyond saving, folks. Jesus, Jesus is ready to save you, despite the fact that you've got nothing to offer. When I tell my story, and, what, and you know, when, for all of you out there that, that feel like, you know, I don't have a story, there's nothing special about me, like, your story is so valuable to tell people, because people need to see the, 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 the stories from the people that feel like it's, 
you know, it's not even all that glamorous, that we didn't turn into major celebrities or something. Your story is valuable because in those cases, the, more, the less that you are, the more that God is reflected in your story. The point of telling our story is not to say, like, I was bad and now I'm good. Look at me. The point of telling our stories is to say, I am bad. Jesus is amazing. <laughs> And you, need to, and you need to see all the things that he could do for you. Everyone needs to hear that story. And so I would just encourage everyone, like, that, you know, think about your story. You know, the, the, the five-minute version and the, you know, the, the three-hour version. And think about the story that he told in the Bible, because all of this connects. Jesus is connecting all of these things. And if you've got nothing to offer, Jesus has plenty to offer you. Let me pray for all of you. Father God, I thank you that, that you are a God that, that, that wants everything from us. That I thank you that you are a God that, that, that doesn't need us to perfect ourselves before we come to you. That you are a God that, that wants us right now in whatever state we're in. And that you will reflect your glory through us and that you will be empowered. I pray that everyone in this room can see that and that those who have forgotten what, what passion means and what, and, what, and what a good life can be, I pray that they can find that in you and that you can redeem them. I thank you that you have redeemed me in such a way, and I pray that everyone else can, can in this room and outside this room and everyone that we come into contact with can hear these stories and that you can be glorified. In your name, amen.